So I guess it's uh, 5.10. Can everybody hear me? Because this is a little on the routine. <laughs> Feels like it's on the, the loud side. Um, it is a mostly repeat of the presentation I did in San Diego, but with new content. So. <laughs> um, so for those of you who, who may have seen this at ELC, I'm mostly going over about 80% of the same stuff. So uh, if there's another talk that you would love to go see instead, by all means, I will not feel offended. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, my name is John Hawley, uh, also known as Warthog9. Um, and I'm going to be talking on open source hardware. So I guess the first question I should ask everybody is, who thinks they know what open source hardware is? Wow. Did you guys just come to this talk to learn everything? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, that, that is actually the lowest number of hands I've ever seen when I've asked that question. So I'm, I'm not sure whether I should be scared and that this is going to go really, really poorly or whether this is going to be awesome. You guys are all going to learn a lot. So I guess I should actually define what open source hardware is. <laughs> Um, so this will go well. Uh, specifically, uh, open source hardware, I am using the Oshawa Open Source Hardware Association 1.0's uh, definition of what open source hardware is. Um, there are more, uh, th there are many definitions out there, and a bunch of them are all weirdly conflicting, and it's really kind of obnoxious. But this is the one I'm going with. Uh, so open source hardware is hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. So I'll let that sink in for a minute. This probably sounds very similar to a lot of licenses we're all used to dealing with on a daily basis, things like the GPL, the BSD, those kinds of things. And when you think about it, well, open source hardware more or less just comes out of the idea of open source software which more or less comes out of the idea, this was all open long ago, why did we ever make it proprietary in the first place? Which is kind of where ESR, or not ESR, uh, RMS, uh, uh, came up with uh, open source software in the first place. But I've told you what uh, open source hardware is, but let me show you what some open source hardware actually looks like. And so we've got um, probably the granddaddy of all the, uh, the open source hardware boards, the Arduino, uh, which uh, really is like one of the first open source hardware uh, boards out there. It really kind of kick-started the entire uh, resurgence of everybody wanting to share their hardware, how they deal with it, um, and, uh, and how they can mix it, match it, you know, make it do what they want. And it's just a microcontroller. There's, no, there, there's not a lot going on here. It's just a simple microcontroller. And as we kind of go up the, the stack here a little bit, you've got things like the Intel Galileo, which is not quite a microcontroller, but not quite an entire PC, uh, um, all the way up through things like the Beagle board, uh, the middle board turbo, and uh, a bunch of the boards from a company called Olimax. These are um, all, you know, uh, everything including the Galileo, other than the Arduino here, is actually you know, full-blown computers. These are you know, general purpose computers, they've got RAM, they've got, you know, full real system on chips uh, attached to them, and they're all kind of in this small board computer arena. And one of the big reasons for that is that when you're making an open source hardware platform, you're making it to solve your own itches, because we all make software that solves our own itches, right? Well, same basic problem. And so uh, you get these boards, they're out there, and what this means is that all of these boards, you can go and you can grab the schematics, you can grab the Gerbers, you can grab the, the source code that gets them up and running, and you can download all of this and start playing with it. So if you wanted to take you know, an Arduino or an Intel Galileo or any of these boards, you can go grab all of this collateral and just start mashing around on it, um, trying to change things. You know, maybe you don't want the gigabit ethernet or, uh, that's on the middle board or the 10100 ethernet that's on the Beagle board. Delete because delete's really, really easy in hardware. <laughs> um, surprisingly, adding things is really, really hard. I, I just, I don't know. Um, but it also, I mean, it gives you references and all that kind of jazz. But one of the things I also wanted to point out is while I'm going to talk a lot about, you know, the, the computers and whatnot, and things like the Arduino, 
there's a lot of open source hardware out there that doesn't have anything more than you know, basic hardware. And there's this company called LittleBit, um, and they make these little click together uh, modules that have some really strong magnets in them so you can actually just start playing with circuits. So it's like uh, um, an even more, you know, please don't fry things and let the uh, magic blue smoke out friendly version of breadboarding. Because everybody's built a breadboard here, right? Everybody knows what a breadboard is, right? Raise your hand if you don't know what a breadboard is. <laughs> you <laughs> are here to do nothing but troll me anyway, so I'm going to ignore you. Yes, it is what you cut your bread on. Chop, 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 chop. Just don't let the magic blue smoke out of the bread. That's usually called penicillin. <laughs> and you probably have lit it on fire or something. I don't know. But um, so yeah, so this kind of gives you an overview of what is open source hardware, what the definition is. And I want to take a couple of seconds to throw out some random questions, and we'll see if you guys uh, actually know your hardware very well. So there's this wonderful board, you might have heard of it, it's called the Raspberry Pi. Who wants to claim it's open source hardware? Oh, I love you all. Thank you. <laughs> Except for you, I still hate you. <laughs> for those on the recording, this is Pidge. Pidge and I have a long-standing agreement that whoever has a, a, a talk, we go to that talk and then we do nothing but troll them in the talk. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I'm the one giving the talk, so I, I'm, I'm the one who's getting trolled today. You have not, uh, liar. <laughs> but um, no, I thank you for that because there are so many people who get confused on uh, 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 that particular platform. It's not open source hardware. They give out, uh, I believe you can get at some of the schematics, but you can't actually get at the Gerbers. You can't really remix it for your own purposes. Um, which is uh, really great to see that you all seem to, to know that. That's uh, actually really quite uh, nice. Uh, let's see, what other platform would be interesting to ask you about? Actually, that's probably the only one I really wanted to quiz you on, so let's keep going. So last Friday, uh, this talk's actually really, really relevant, uh, surprisingly. Last Friday, the Open Source Hardware Association uh, did its annual meeting in uh, Portland, Oregon. And so this information is only like four or five days old. Um, but they announced uh, one of the big things that's happened in the open source hardware world uh, in the last year, literally, uh, is uh, the Open Source Hardware Association came out with a full certification process for open source hardware. Um, and they discussed this last year at their meeting in uh, Philadelphia uh, and, and what, what, what it was going to entail, roughly at that time anyway, uh, uh, and how it was going to go. And this year, at the Open Source Hardware Association meeting, they actually uh, published, the, uh, published the, the certification and how it was all going to work. And briefly overview, um, and thankfully this is not a, a hugely long certification, it's a self-certification. So basically what uh, they're depending on is that if you believe your platform is open source hardware and should receive this, uh, this particular logo, they're more or less going to take you at your word. So if you, if you believe that you actually put uh, your platform out there to meet the open source hardware guidelines, so you know, it's out there, you can download it, uh, you can uh, modify it, you know, recreate it, you know, uh, sell it, those kinds of things, you know, going back to that original definition. If you believe you meet all of that, um, you, can, uh, you, you can apply to get the logo. And um, more or less, this gives you the logo. You get a unique number for uh, your, your design, and they really are trying to limit it to your design. So if I was to take you know, uh, a, a, a board that, let, let, let's just go with an example here, uh, of a, uh, a PCB that is designed for blimp control. And, and, <laughs> and I was to, to take this open source hardware design that uh, let, let, let's just say that somebody in this room may have made. And I was to modify it so that it actually controlled a small robotic dog. <laughs> I, would be, I would be required, uh, or I, I'm not required, but I am requested very strongly to go ahead and go and get a new um, ID number so that, it, uh, so that the board that I've made is actually unique in, in comparison to this other board. 
Uh, and uh, as well as it, more or less that means that if there's problems with the original board, they go after the, uh, the original author who submitted their, their identification. If there's a problem with the board I would make, they, go, they come and they talk to me. So yes. My board didn't catch on fire and it did. Yes. They the, go after you. Yes. So the, the, for the people at home, it, it, if the board that controlled the dog caught on fire as opposed to the one that uh, was used in a blimp, they would have to come and talk to me. But it catching on fire is not exactly an open source hardware problem. <laughs> That's just a, you know, it caught on fire problem. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so this is the, the first version of the license. It's actually, uh, a number of people have actually asked me what I think of it. And um, this is where I go uh, out and I stand on my own opinion. This is nothing but my own. I've read the standard, it's actually really simple, and I actually agree with it. Um, it, it it's, uh, if you violate it, uh, they come after you. If you don't violate it, you're pretty much, it, it's really no different than taking the open source hardware logo that we currently have and slapping it on your board. But with this, you actually get a, uh, a small amount more of uh, reassurance that there's somebody's actually policing this if there are problems. And so I, I actually very strongly uh, agree with this particular definition. And I think a lot more of the things that I personally am going to be putting out, I will be going and getting the certification and whatnot. Um, if you're interested, uh, go out to the Open Source Hardware Association's website. They've got a big old link right on the front page right now. Uh, which is OSHWA.org, if I remember correctly. Um, and you can go read this. I actually recommend going and doing it if you're doing anything in hardware. Which, actually, I guess that leads to an interesting question. How many of you are actually building hardware? Okay. How many of you would like to build hardware? <laughs> How many of you are very scared of hardware and wish it would catch on fire? <laughs> Okay. Um, so there you go. Uh, yes. So yes, there is, there is a registry. Um, so what what happens is, is when you want to certify your product, and I when I say certify, I'm using their uh, definition of certify because they do no checking uh, of whether. Uh, oh, am I getting? Oh, this is what happens when <laughs> I don't pay attention to the laptop. Um, all that you do to get your number is basically you email them and say, I have this product, here's my, here's my information, and they just send you a number back. It is what I understand to be their intention. I don't know if anybody's actually gone through this and gotten a number yet, but I'm sure that several people have already emailed them uh, to do this. What happens is, is if they get a complaint, then they go back and review what you've done to make sure that uh, you are actually complying. And when you go to, to, to get this, you're basically agreeing to them that if I screw up and I'm not actually in compliance, you may uh, uh, assess damages uh, of either yelling at me and or monetary, you know, I, have my, I must pay you to continue to keep this certification as well as resolving the issue that may be being brought up. So I know that there's a few people who have claimed that why would you sign up because all you're doing is uh, opening yourself up to uh, uh, complaints. But frankly, you know, having this means that it's uh, much simpler to go if there is a problem with your board or not being open source, hard actually being open source hardware, it gives you a, a mechanism to actually go back and say you're not. And please either become open source hardware or drop the logo. Which is, which is something you don't have with the, the existing open source hardware logo, because anybody can just grab it and use it, and there's no, uh, there's no trademark or licensing associated with the other logo, so it's just kind of out there. So, some other things that came out of uh, the open source hardware meeting, that was the big one. The rest of the stuff's actually way more fun. Um, one of the things that came out of it is that uh, open source hardware is really starting to make its way into the medical field. Uh, if anybody's ever you know, seen the medical field, this is actually a, a, an area where technology can help people a lot, but people are very technology averse here because th there's so much regulation that normally goes into a, a piece of hardware to get basic uh, approval to even try something. Well. Uh, the gentleman on the right uh, gave a talk about how he's using uh, a, a lot of this technology in India 
to do exploratory information on uh, uh, how to better give treatment. So he, he, they used uh, a platform where they hooked up uh, sensors to uh, surgeons' fingers to figure out how much pressure they were putting on to sutures uh, in certain procedures because uh, life expectancy was actually directly correlated to how much, pr uh, if you put too much or too little pressure on this particular suture, you killed the patient, literally. And so they, they uh, were uh, recording that information so they could go back and actually teach new doctors by uh, measuring their own uh, pressure, uh, what was, uh, whether they would be you know, saving the patient's life or killing them. Uh, and as well as several other uh, places where they're using open hardware and they're making all of this available because not, they, they want to not only use it for their own purposes but they want to share it because obviously if you can you know, measure something and then help someone you know, learn from it, the suturing technique here, you're just going to do nothing but save more lives. And the amount of, you know, har the, the hardware they're using is less than $100 uh, worth of gear. So there's nothing that really should be stopping anybody from doing this. And they were talking about the success story they had there. They also uh, uh, had a great talk uh, from the uh, EXIII Hackberry guys um, about a, a, a 3D printable prosthetic and how um, they're getting, or, or, or where that's going uh, uh, in, their, in their world and the, the kinds of things that people are doing with it. And so that, uh, you know, open source prosthetics, a lot of medical stuff's really coming up in the open source hardware world, which this is, uh, which this is um, substantially uh, grown since last year. There was one talk last year, there were two and a half, three um, talks this year that focused no on nothing but medical with respect to open source hardware. So if you, if you want to start playing in the open source hardware world, start paying attention to some of the, uh, the medical stuff. And Tracy's got her hand up in the back. Am I allowed to add to this? You, you may add anything you want. I'm just going to have to repeat it. So to, uh, to regurgitate what Tracy has just suggested is um, one of the things that this is really uh, helping with is kids. Um, kids grow so fast and uh, normal prosthetics are so expensive that more or less kids don't get access to the, the prosthetics because each, each one of these in the traditional sense is thousands of dollars. And if the kid's going to outgrow it in six months, well, people, aren't going to, they, people don't want to outlay that constantly. And what this is doing is that it's giving people uh, the ability to make a more modular system. And when the kid outgrows uh, just the, uh, the hookup, they can replace just the hookup with a slightly bigger one. And you get longer longevity out of uh, the rest of the pieces, um, as well as being able to more specifically customize it to individuals. You know, because, not, because not every uh, uh, reason why you would need a prosthetic is identical. So you may have to customize it dramatically more, and they're able to do that. So um, great talk from the uh, EXII Hackberry guys on that. Um, and there were uh, two other spaces where uh, open source hardware was um, being discussed that really hasn't come up a whole lot lately. Uh, on the, on, I guess on your left, on my right, um, there's, uh, there was a talk from the National Park Service in the United States about how they're actually picking up open source hardware and using it more and more for two simple reasons. One, it lowers their cost of uh, putting together demos and uh, interactive exhibits, as well as two, it allows them to set these things up for themselves and then be able to share that with other uh, 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 national parks or museums and whatnot. And it build, it, it's building a much greater ecosystem where pieces, uh, a, a single entity can do a lot of development work and allow a lot of other uh, places to pick this up. And so uh, they gave a great talk on how the, uh, they're using some open source uh, hardware stuff and what they were doing with it and uh, the number of national parks that are, are starting to pick that kind of stuff up. As well as, who wants to go to space? Who wants to send things to space? Who wants to possibly want to send things to space, but instead they explode on the launch pad? OK, so you're Elon Musk. <laughs> oh, you just want to see me. Um, 
The uh, Portland Aerospace Society um, actually gave a great talk about how they believe that not only are they the first ones to have sent a Linux box into space, which I can test, uh, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will actually contest their claim. So I'm sorry, Portland Aerospace guys. I, I'm pretty sure I know prior art to that one. Um, but uh, how they're, they're actually sharing their information with three other universities right now uh, to have a, and I'm going to put this in quotes, um, a race <laughs> to see which of these three universities can actually get a uh, amateur rocket into orbit. Uh, in, into uh, orbit where it will actually stay in orbit, not like low Earth orbit or anything, but no, like satellite uh, 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 level orbit. And so they, uh, they were describing a lot of the, the systems and software that they've been using and how they've started collaborating. So again, we're starting to see open source hardware permeating outside of what we would normally expect, um, you know, to where you'd normally expect to see it and it's starting to get into to spaces um, that I honestly wouldn't have expected to get to yet. But, uh, kind of drifting away from the Open Source Hardware Association's meeting, one of the other big things that's uh, come up in the last couple of weeks from an open source hardware perspective is Arduino is no longer two different entities. They, are, they have finally reconciled there is one Arduino again. So everybody who has a Genuino, take it out of your project, put it on a shelf somewhere because in like 20 years it'll actually be worth money. <laughs> and then go buy a real Arduino again. But um, so, the, uh, so that's actually re relatively big news. If you aren't familiar with the controversy, um, it all boiled down to some trademark issues and a manufacturer and uh, Massimo basically ended up splitting ways for about a year, almost two years, I guess. Um, they've now since reconciled that and uh, they had a, a great announcement where they were both on stage at the New York Maker Fair um, uh, a couple weeks ago. So there was that. And let's see what else there is interesting to talk about. So, uh, also in the last year, uh, how many people have heard of the, uh, the little small board computer called Chip? How many of you backed it on Kickstarter? Oh, well, actually, that's a pretty good number. Um, Chip is a very small board computer. It's about yay big, so about, I don't know, what, three inches square, give or take, for those of you who have actually gotten your chip. Um, it's a $9 computer. And I say computer with a little bit of trepidation because it's barely better than a microcontroller. <laughs> but it has just enough of the pieces to make it a real computer. Um, but they raised a Kickstarter uh, about a year and a half ago for about $2 million to build these things. And they've actually been one of the, 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 the poster children for open source hardware. They've gone so far as to, they've given, um, they've released all of their BOM, their Gerbers, their, their schematics. Um, they are uh, a fantastic example of just open source hardware because they've done all of that. And on top of that, they've actually gone so far as to try and um, keep costs down. They've actually gone and pioneered new techniques into dealing with the hardware they've got. So like they've got um, MMC on their, on their board, but they have no uh, EMMC controller specifically. They're doing all of their EMMC controller uh, functions in the main CPU itself. And this is actually saving them money because they no longer have to pay the cost to deal with uh, the, the MMC controller. And, and they've done several things uh, along those lines specifically to get the price of this, this hardware down. So they're actually pioneering this uh, uh, not only for themselves but for, uh, to get this for everybody else. Yep. Basically, this is a warning that it's very hacked up hardware. I'm sorry? It's a warning that the hardware is messed up. It's not so much a warning that the hardware is messed up. It's a warning that uh, 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 software is now good enough to take over certain aspects of uh, what the, uh, of the hardware was doing. S same basic example if you look at uh, RAID controllers. Many, many years ago, RAID controllers were the only way to get really fast um, high-speed throughput on storage. Nowadays, if you want the fastest throughput for your storage, you use software RAID because your, your main CPU is exponentially faster than any, RAID card on the, any hardware RAID card on the market. And 
it's also thousands of dollars cheaper. <laughs> that being said, for the record, I actually still run hardware raid on all of my co-load boxes, and so. There are reasons to continue with the old hardware, I, it, but this is, you know, what the chip guys are doing is mostly pioneering. If you're trying to get to the lowest cost board, they're trying to take as many pieces of the hardware equation out because each piece of hardware just costs you money. And if you've already got a main CPU, well, try and push more of the functionality there. If you want to think about it, this is like the wind modem of eMMC. Except that's a really horrible analogy because we, you'll all instantly hate it. Yes, it, it, it's much more like a, a wind modem or a parallel port that you literally just bit bang. It, but they're actually seeing really good performance off of it. So, as and and they've done it in the open, so it's not a wind modem. <laughs> and um, this is a little bit older news, uh, but still definitely interesting. Uh, is about a year ago, uh, actually no, about. Um, Earlier, it's, it was earlier this year, just before uh, the Embedded Linux conference in San Diego. Uh, Google uh, signed on to the Open Compute Project, which how many people here have actually heard of the Open Compute Project? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Um, what this is, it's a consortium of groups that are building gigantic data centers. Facebook, Google now, obviously. Um, I, and I'm going to forget who else is involved in it. I know it's Google and Facebook for sure. Um, but uh, they're specifically designing hardware, open hardware, to share amongst uh, big data centers to try and cut down on power usage, get better uh, thermal performance, and to cut out any piece in the entire equation that could draw uh, extra power that's not needed. I mean, how many people have, uh, have actually looked at the servers that they're deploying and possibly seen a sound card on it? Okay, that's actually better than I, or, I, I'm glad none of you have seen that, I have. Um, and for a while there, there was software requirements to put sound cards into servers, because this totally makes, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but it was still done for a while. Um, but, you know, the, uh, basically what these big, uh, you know, uh, entities, Facebook, Google, are finding that, is that anything extra that's been added to a server, uh, in any way, not only cost them money, but will sit there idle and possibly um, vampire power off the system. Which if you've got a piece of hardware that's embedded into several thousand uh, computers, and each one of them is now drawing, you know, we'll just call it a milliamp, a single milliamp, you're now drawing a thousand milliamps of power that's literally doing nothing but generating heat. So you're now also generating electricity to uh, eradicate uh, the heat through cooling. And it just kind of snowballs very quickly. And what the uh, Open Compute Project is obviously trying to do is they're all trying to share their knowledge, build hardware, switches, servers, um, so that they can uh, kind of cut down on those kinds of things. And uh, Google uh, joined uh, uh, the Open Compute Project uh, earlier this year. And Kickstarter, if anybody's ever you know, backed anything on Kickstarter, open source hardware is popping up all over the place on Kickstarter. And this is kind of unsurprising because Kickstarter is really great for kickstarting your project. And there's a lot of people who want to uh, go and build on um, existing open source hardware platforms, BeagleBone, uh, MinnowBoard, Arduino. Arduino's huge uh, off of Kickstarter. And so there, there's a lot of success stories. There's a lot of failures that are coming up on Kickstarter. But if you're ever wanting to kind of get in on the ground floor of uh, open source hardware, go, go poke around on Kickstarter and see what, uh, uh, what's actually going on there. They have an entire section uh, dedicated to open hardware. And it's not just you know, small board computers or things like the, um, the chip. There's a lot of other things that are going on there, too. So. I'm kind of slowly running out of time here, but um, quick overview of uh, kind of where we're at and where we're going. Um, open source hardware adoption uh, and creation is accelerating. This is unsurprising. Uh, it's following almost the exact same trajectory that uh, open source software followed uh, in its infancy. Um, 
and it, I mean, we're literally just seeing that in open hardware now. Uh, low speed designs, so things that don't need um, uh, differential pair routing or anything like that. Um, people are doing them all over the place. So Arduino-based designs, things that hook up to SPI, I squared C, um, pretty much anything in the IoT space. Um, uh, people are really starting to, to take a look at open source hardware and software um, if they aren't already. And in fact, there's a, a lot of um, uh, people starting to advocate, me included, that uh, if, if you're doing an IoT design, please start thinking about being open with it up front because at some point you're going to want to ditch that design, and if you've ditched it and stopped supporting it, this is, what happen this is how we get to uh, IoT distributed denial of service attacks, because no one's maintaining it. And so uh, um, you've got that going now. Um, and higher speed design, so things that use PCI Express or anything with differential routing, um, they're still continuing, uh, so, uh, but obviously at a slower pace. They're much harder to, to do for the normal human being. Um, the, the tools aren't quite as good, although uh, uh, design tools like KeyCAD now have differential uh, pair automatic routing. Um, but uh, KeyCAD, in the general sense, excuse me, is still um, complicated to use, and it's not, a, a, it's not super user friendly. So, at this point, I've got about 10 minutes, and I will answer anything on open hardware. In my next talk, I'll literally answer anything, but that's downstairs. So, how many, uh, how many people think that they actually have a vague idea of what open source hardware is now? Okay. Is there anything you're confused on in that space? You don't get to ask any questions anymore. <laughs> um, somebody's gotta have a question, okay. Yep. And is it included in this kind of initiative? So uh, the question is, is um, a couple of years ago there was an initiative to kind of push for open source graphics cards. Uh, is, are those included in here? Yes. Um, my understanding is that they're still working on it, but I haven't seen any big exciting news from them lately. Um, so they're not a whole lot interesting to talk about. I know that they're still working on it. Um, last I saw, um, and this is a while ago, so my, my information's outdated, um, they had gotten it uh, working on an FP, a large FPGA board and had, had done some prototyping there. Um, there are some other things that uh, similarly come out uh, in the last couple of weeks, not on the graphics card side, but there, uh, where various companies, or various entities, not companies, are. Um, have done uh, chip, design, chip designs for other purposes where they've specifically wire bonded it to PCBs and they've had some pretty interesting success on that in the last couple of weeks. So the, the open source graphics card stuff, last I heard, is still ongoing, but again, I just haven't seen anything lately. My understanding is that it's the chip itself. Uh, oh, uh, so far. oh, so far, yes. So somebody else had a question. Actually, yeah. You don't have it. Uh, I wonder about the PCB design software. You mentioned KeyCard as being one option that is truly mm -hmm. open source hardware. Yep. But I haven't used KeyCard lately. Mm -hmm. but, uh, oftentimes it's a, it's a company-wide decision which, which PCB software to use. And the company sites all really use Altium, for example. Yep. You're stuck with Altium. And so yeah, so the... the um, question is, or question or comment, kind of combination of the two, um, is that it's a pretty much a company-wide decision on what CAD software you're going to use to design PCBs. I mean, KeyCAD's nice, but you're right. If a company has decided on Altium, you know, in all likelihood, you're going to meet the path of least resistance to try and do your hardware design in Altium. Um, generally speaking, the Open Source Hardware Association is okay with that, and most people in the open source hardware hardware world will understand it, but it's a decision that you're going to have to be, that you, you, I would recommend pushing against for the simple fact that trying to get an Altium license in particular, I believe seats start at $10,000. If, if somebody's got better, a better idea on the pricing, my understanding it's somewhere in the, uh, the $10,000 range, at least 
in the back of my head. Um, which means that if, you're re if you really want somebody else to be able to come and pick up your design and change it and modify it, now you're talking about them needing a $10,000 chunk of software to do it. Um, that being said, there are some commercial solutions out there that um, are generally more friendly to the open source hardware world, Eagle um, being the obvious choice, KiCad because it's completely open source, um, but, uh, and there's a few other niche um, and smaller, some open source, some not, uh, design tools there. But I mean, things like uh, even the Minnow board, um, which is a, a, an open source hardware platform, uh, the only way to get at the actual files for that are uh, other than the Gerbers, because anybody can read Gerbers, which is nice. Um, I think uh, the original design um, was done in ORCAD. It's been ported to um, uh, Mentor Graphics uh, tool suite, and I believe somebody the other day was talking to me that it's being ported to another design suite. Um, but you know, all three of these design suites are the big expensive ones, unfortunately but it's also a 10 layer board. It has a lot of high speed routing on it. It just, it's not something that Eagle is specifically could handle well and trying to get it ported over to KiCad probably be a bit of a nightmare. Um, not that it's not doable, it's just the tool doesn't handle that kind of complexity as well. So I, I, I don't know if I've exactly answered your question. Uh, yeah. Correct. And, well, and, and I think right now, I mean, if you're going to design like a little Arduino board in Altium, I think people will laugh at you because that's like trying to use a, a nuclear hand grenade to, to swat a fly. <laughs> um, but, um, but when you're doing some of the bigger designs, things like um, uh, the Olimex boards or something like the Minnow board, you know, you're just going to end up in that kind of space anyway. But uh, I do know that the Beagle board black, or no, Beagle board black with the new chip that they've got, um, they've uh, ported it over to Eagle with a six layer board. Um, and uh, uh, I think they've got a six layer design and a four layer design uh, done in Eagle. So it is possible things are getting better, so. Okay, so for the folks at home, um, uh, a comment uh, in addition was that Olimax has switched over to doing KiCad exclusively um, and that they've got new designs, particularly with uh, some like all winner 64 bit chips that are in the works right now. So. Yep. Yeah, the, the workflow and the UI is basically the, the big problem in KiCad at this point. But um, to uh, restate what you just said, was that uh, Olimax is actually going in and supporting KiCad development and that KiCad's basically getting a lot better. I mean, there's a lot of companies and entities, um, CERN specifically uh, added the uh, differential pair routing stuff, the uh, uh, push-pull uh, automatic routing into KiCad. So. I will actually take your question. It's actually a question. Uh, Liar. Spur. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this is stuff that both you and I have been talking about and screaming about pretty much right Yes. Um, and we still see resistance within consumer electronics. Yep. Device. Um, so earlier this year, the revolve from the modification hub, uh, that was a whole Yep. Okay, um, so let's see if I've got a good summary on that, is that when large companies or any company um, puts out an IoT device or a consumer electronic device, 
Um, am I, are we starting to see with the now larger failures, and I'm gonna put, fail, it's not exactly a failure, but the larger departure or uh, abandonment of that product, um, uh, are we starting to see those kinds of abandonment uh, actually push uh, people towards wanting to do open hardware or even or, or, or even to to try and get the larger consumer entities that when they do the abandonment chuck everything over the fence um, I would argue yes um, there's a, a, a growing uh, uh, rather vocal um, group of people again me included on that particular front um, advocating that when you do abandon these kinds of things just chuck the stuff over the fence because at least I mean there there are, I, I can't imagine that there's anyone in this room that doesn't have some piece of hardware in their house doing something that they actually care a great deal about, that the company is either out of business, the product line has, um, you know what, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, uh, the product line was discontinued or something. It, it, raise your hand if everything in your house is fully supported by the manufacturer. <laughs> you, no. I moved. I moved. Okay, I fine. I, the, <laughs> She doesn't count, because I, I can think of at least a dozen different devices in my own house. My IP cameras, my music system, which is based on uh, Squeezebox, uh, which uh, Logitech promptly dropped the um, hardware support for. Uh, you know, just there's a plethora of different devices in, in, in I think, any of our houses. And with the, uh, the advent of IoT, which is great, you know, we're getting all the, the, this new functionality into these devices, but what happens when Samsung or um, LG or any of these companies stop pushing updates to their TVs or their washing machines or their thermostats, which is yeah. what uh, uh, Beth was referring to? Um, what happens when all of this happens? Well, now you've got this really nice brick or this really great platform for DDoS for hackers. So, anyone else? Bueller? Well, I thank you for coming. Uh, there's a minnow board boff that's going to be downstairs in five or 10 minutes. Um, I know that the Yocto table is doing another giveaway just before their boff. And with that, I wish you the, uh, a great conference. <laughs>